this begins an interview with Commander Tommy Mariner at the Center for the Study of Tennesseans in War. Uh, my name is Andrew Dingus. I'm an intern here at the Center, and across from me is the, center, the Center's Director, Dr. Macri. Hmm. Well, we're so pleased to have Commander Tommy Mariner here with us today. Um, had to hear his story about his wife, Captain Rosemary Mariner. Uh, so anything you can have, wherever you want to start with Rosemary's life and, and whatever you want to tell us, we just appreciate it. Okay, let me do that. Uh, well, Rosemary was born in 1953 in Harlington, Texas. Uh, she was a uh, military bat, brat uh, and her father was a uh, Air Force at the time uh, captain. Uh, he was in charge of a, a wing of students at Harlingen uh, when she was born in the hospital down there. Her mother is a World War, was also a World War II veteran uh, Navy nurse who had predominantly served in uh, the Canal Zone in, uh, in Panama. Uh, her father had flown in World War II, principally flown uh, A-26s, which are uh, kind of a medium attack bomber and also uh, C-47 transports, which uh, today we know better probably as uh, DC-3s, which are, a few of them are still around flying in the world, uh, big radial engines that powered those things. And he actually enjoyed uh, flying the uh, uh, C-17 uh, more than he did the, uh, the A-26, because it, it was an interesting airplane. It killed a lot of people until they learned a little bit about its characteristics because it had two great big engines uh, out fairly far from the uh, center of gravity and uh, uh, that airplane had some interesting characteristics especially if it lost an engine. Uh, so Rosemary uh, started off as a child on the base and uh, when she was three years old after the her sister Linda was born her father was killed in a airplane accidents uh, flying a T-29 into uh, taking it actually up to Long Island uh, to get reworked uh, uh, for a normal rework of uh, aircraft and he had engine problems and tried to uh, make an emergency landing at uh, Dobbins Air Force Base and he and his uh, uh, co-pilot crashed and were both killed in, in the crash. So uh, Connie uh, Rosemary's mother was widowed at a young age and had two young children. So she moved back to California. Uh, her, uh, his family, the Bryant family, was largely based around Sacramento. And so she moved there to get support from the family and uh, particularly her grandmother, uh, Sylvia, and uh, Rosemary's cousin. So Rosemary grew up uh, mostly in California. Uh, they did, she did, uh, Connie met a, a lady who was uh, a gentleman who uh, on a cruise uh, to Hawaii and uh, they got romantically involved and eventually got married. Uh, had a third daughter, uh, Libby, and uh, moved off to for uh, a year or so to Alaska. The uh, Alaska earthquake happened and uh, so the children were sent back to California uh, and they uh, stayed with the uh, cousins and the grandparents for a good while. And then uh, eventually moving uh, to San Diego uh, when they came, when Connie and, and Greg came back from uh, Alaska. And they settled in uh, uh, with Connie uh, basically being the primary support of the family as a nurse. She got a nurse uh, nursing job at Mercy Hospital. She was a nurse anesthetist, so she did a lot of work delivering babies and, and uh, for a lot of the uh, San Diego Chargers. And she used to brag about uh, the various uh, uh, families that she had delivered children to. And uh, she was relatively active as a veteran. Uh, she enjoyed things like singing, uh, particularly with a group called the Coraliers in uh, northern San Diego up on the Mesa. Uh, and uh, so Rosemary grew up uh, on a little street called Lodi Street, about a 
a mile or so away from uh, the runway at uh, Miramar Naval Air Station, which was the center for fighters on the West Coast uh, for the Navy. And so she, uh, by the time she became a, a preteen, uh, she was babysitting uh, her sisters uh, by taking them out in the canyon, uh, going down underneath the interstate and crawling up the, uh, the edge of the mesa and uh, sitting and watching uh, uh, F-4s and F-8s uh, and A-4s take off out of uh, Miramar and dreaming about flying. Uh, Rosemary was a, a voracious reader and particularly of uh, the novels of Ernest Gann and uh, a lot of the writings of people from World War II uh, were of interest to her uh, but mostly it was the romance of, of, the, of the aviation that uh, sparked uh, Rosemary's uh, interest. She uh, spent a, a lot of time trying to figure out how to get as close as she could to airplanes. She joined the Civil Air Patrol briefly, but they they had lots of meetings and didn't do much flying. So uh, Rosemary uh, made herself available to work uh, wash airplanes uh, out at uh, Brown and Gillespie Field uh, in uh, uh, northern San Diego. And uh, she was uh, active in, in doing stuff like to raise money, uh, uh, cleaning houses, and finally she won a contest uh, to uh, name the movie of the week that was on one of the uh, shows and she called in and was the first person that they uh, gave a chance to answer it and she got that uh, uh, correct, uh, Fate is the Hunter. Uh, which was a, a World War II movie about um, an interesting story of a, uh, a guy who was uh, an airline pilot and uh, had an accident and uh, turned out that there were a lot of a lot of details and stuff with that that, that were left out of the, some of the initial investigations. And, uh, anyway, Rosemary uh, earned two hundred dollars for that, and that gave her enough money to start flying lessons. And uh, knowing people at uh, the various fields around, uh, she was uh, picked up pretty quickly by the instructors who saw a, a willing and very interested young lady uh, who, was, who uh, was very aggressive and wanting to fly anytime she could. And uh, she was taught by a couple of guys who were uh, instructor pilots uh, at uh, Sweetwater, uh, Texas, at the uh, airfield that the WASP did their training on World War II. So Rosemary was uh, became very aware of the experience of women flying and doing all sorts of flying with anything that was uh, in the military inventory. Uh, a knowledge that sort of waned in the uh, late 1950s, early 1960s, as the women came home, uh, she also was aware of the, that the women had just been cut off in December of uh, uh, 1944. Uh, the military uh, made the decision that we don't need the women uh, flying anymore. We've got all these men coming back. They can fill the flying jobs. Uh, and the women were in a very difficult position at that point. Uh, many of them uh, had their husbands and their, uh, in some cases, brothers, in some cases sons, and, some, and in many cases fathers, coming back from war. And at the time, most of the households were financed by the uh, father uh, income. So many of the women were pushed out of jobs. Rosie the Riveter came home from the factories in large numbers, uh, went back to being housewives. Uh, the jobs that were open were nurse and uh, teacher and caregiver uh, and homemaker pretty much. And those were about the only uh, real options. Uh, and women had a tough time at that point complaining about that because they were happy to get the men home 
They were happy to go back to the jobs that they'd had, but they'd had a great time, many of them, uh, such as Connie. Her uh, greatest uh, love was the, talking about stories about when she was in the military, and she had enjoyed her time in, in Panama, uh, and uh, so Rosemary was aware of all that uh, sociological uh, reality that was, it was just different than the time it is today. And she wanted to open those opportunities for herself. And she was aware that women could do things that a lot of people weren't aware of. So uh, when she was a high school student, uh, she spent most of her time trying to figure out ways to get more flight time. And she uh, earned her private pilot license on her 17th birthday. Uh, finished up high school a year early. Uh, didn't spend time uh, as a cheerleader or working uh, in clubs there, she was always out at the, at the airport. And uh, that served her very well because uh, uh, she found a program at Purdue University that was opening up to women. Uh, she applied to Purdue and got accepted, uh, started out as a physics major, and, uh, but quickly the first semester changed over to uh, become an aeronautics major and take part in the Purdue aviation program. They had a little Purdue Airlines, uh, which flew people around, coaches and, and professors and stuff to recruit people and go to meetings all over the uh, central part of the United States, uh, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and, uh, and then pick up recruits and bring those people home, go to their homes and stuff. And Rosemary was always uh, very willing to fly. I've talked to uh, one of her classmates there, and, and uh, Rosemary was uh, very well liked, and, and uh, on her, on the staff at uh, Purdue in uh, 1934, uh, Amelia Earhart had been an advisor, and so Rosemary once again realized that women could do lots of things. Uh, she was also aware of, of uh, the WASS because Jill uh, McCord was her uh, instructor uh, for simulator, and she trained in a, a 707 simulator uh, at Purdue, and they were training them to be flight engineers to get a job. It was a basically a professional pilot's course, and uh, in the middle of the third year, uh, in the summertime, uh, she got a notification from her mom that the Navy was thinking about opening up program to women. So uh, Rosemary uh, decided that she had never thought about being in the military, uh, didn't think it was an option. Her principal focus was to become an airline pilot and was told by the vice president of American Airlines that uh, women are never going to be able to do that. Uh, that's not a job for women. You ought to figure out something else to do. And, uh, she worked in the simulator for a while down in San Diego in the summers, and they said kind of the same thing. We can train you to be a, a flight attendant, but we uh, used to training women to be uh, flight engineers. Mm -hmm. So she had a little bit of difficulty uh, button heads with people on that, but she persevered. And so when the Navy opened up, that, that was an entirely new adventure that she had no idea that uh, she wanted to do. Her mom had been in the Navy, uh, her dad, uh, of course, had been in the Air Force, and so uh, Rosemary decided that she would apply. The uh, Navy was accepting eight people. Uh, four women were on, already on active duty, and but the Navy was looking for eight, so they opened up four slots to civilian women who could go through the uh, officer candidate program. At that, at that time, it was Women Officers School which basically was a school to teach you good manners and how to be a, an office worker uh, in the Navy and, and supervise people in the, in the Navy. Uh, Rosemary didn't have much use for that training. Uh, she would have been much happier training with the aviation officer candidates who were being uh, run by Marine drill sergeants like I was. Uh, and, and I joined uh, about a, a year after Rosemary did. But anyway, she finished up her last semester uh, of school, so she finished uh, Purdue in two and a half years. 
because Purdue had a very liberal challenge policy at the time. And her instructors helped her. Uh, and her professors, her advisor, made sure that she knew all the courses that, that she needed. She already had enough courses in her core uh, discipline of aeronautics to graduate. Uh, she had earned an associate's degree in the spring. And so she had all the requisite requirements for the, the professional certifications. And she was teaching already as a certified flight instructor and a certified instrument instructor and uh, had her commercial pilot tickets. And so she had about 600 hours of flight time uh, before she joined the Navy, which was a lot more than most people. I'd, I'd flown in a Navy airplane one time and a couple of times in, in civilian airplanes. Uh, whenever I joined, but uh, so Rosemary showed up uh, in uh, Pensacola after finishing women officer school. Uh, all eight women started, two women dropped out, uh, one because her husband wanted her to, she got, not got married, and he immediately started lobbying her to get out, which Rosemary saw as a problem for women, and, and one that would occur on, on occasions in her experience and her uh, uh, advice to women, and she ended up uh, having a lot of women come to her for advice, was uh, keep the jet and get rid of the jerk. And uh, uh, she figured that anybody that wanted you to stop doing something that you loved didn't really have your best interest at heart. So six of the women finished flight training. Uh, two of them went off to helicopter training. Uh, and uh, four of the women went into propeller training. Rosemary had the top grades in her uh, in her primary flight training class, some of the top grades that anybody had, had in that year, and uh, they would not let her fly jets. I had the top grades in, in my class significantly lower than, than Rosemary's grades, and of course I had no trouble uh, getting into the jet pipeline. pipeline. Uh, so uh, Rosemary uh, went off to Milton after her training, uh, initial training in the uh, T-34 and then the T-28. Uh, then she went down to uh, finish up her T-28 training because her squadron moved from uh, the Pensacola area to Corpus Christi. And she finished up her flight training there in uh, first uh, T-28s, completed, of course, all the uh, requirements to be a naval aviator, except they didn't let a carrier qualify. Uh, just before the women uh, were ready to go out to the ship, the Navy made the decision, no, the women can't go to the ship. And then they actually changed the entire pipeline around to where propeller pilots that weren't going to a ship-based squadron, they didn't, they didn't uh, get to uh, carrier qualify anymore. I talked to one of the guys who was cut out of carrier qualifying at that same time. Uh, a few months ago, he, I said, he said, I never understood why the Navy cut me out of going to the ship because my previous class had gotten to go. I said, well, you were in the same class that Rosemary was. He said, yeah. I said, well, that's why. They didn't want the women to go, so they cut the men out also because it wouldn't be quite as much overt discrimination. So uh, Rosemary, that's the first letter that they wrote. Uh, they wrote a letter of protest that they wanted to be allowed to do uh, carrier qualification. Uh, they learned very early on that if you write letters in the, up the Navy chain of command, if you just ask, people can tell you no very easily. But if you write a letter and uh, send it up the chain, people have to endorse that letter along the way. And if you keep track of it, they lose it, uh, you can always send another. And so that's what they had to do in a few cases. But uh, the women did not do carrier qualification. Rosemary went from the T-28 over to the S2 uh, and the, uh, its equivalent, the uh, uh, C1 and the T2, T1. And that twin engine airplane uh, was what she finished up in, and she got her orders to her first squadron, uh, VC2, in uh, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, out on, at Virginia Beach, out at uh, the Naval Air Station, Oceana. And, uh, when Rosemary started her career, though, that was very lucky because she, when she checked in soon after her check-in the next month, uh, a new commander took over, and uh, 
uh, he and Ray Lambert, uh, Commander Ray Lambert, uh, ended up being one of the one of the guiding lights to her career. He was a black uh, A6 pilot, Vietnam veteran, combat veteran, and most of the people, particularly the senior lieutenants and the lieutenant commanders, the commanders in her first squadron, were all Vietnam veterans. Most of them A4 pilots. Uh, their squadron had uh, about a dozen A4s, and they had four uh, US twos, which were a utility version of the S2 tracker, which is a anti-submarine warfare aircraft, uh, twin-engine propeller aircraft. So Rosemary was uh, billeted to fly those, but she immediately, within a couple of months, started jumping in the back seat of the A4s. They had two seaters and a number of single-seat A4s. And so Rosemary actually flew for almost a year uh, in the back seat of every airplane she could get a chance to go flying in. Um, and uh, even landed from the back seat eventually. Uh, but Ray Lambert, uh, soon after she checked in uh, uh, to the squadron, or, to, or he took over uh, as CO, he had been the executive officer uh, when she first got there. Uh, he sat Rosemary down and said, and opened the desk drawer and said, I, in here I've got a list of all of the black officers and all of the black uh, pilots in the Navy. And we keep in touch. We work together uh, to make sure that we're aware of what's going on in the military. Uh, we let people know our problems. Uh, we mentor each other. And uh, we communicate. We network all the time. He said, if I've got a problem, I, uh, particularly when I was a junior officer, these are the people I talk to. Uh, now I do a lot of mentoring for other people. She said he told her that if you're going to be successful in your Navy career as a woman, uh, you're going to have to do the same thing because the Navy is going to oppose you at many times. And even when the Navy is not opposing you, individuals will get in your way. And so if you want to be successful, network with other people and mentor. And, and Rosemary did that from pretty much from the start of her, her career. Uh, after about a year of the squadron, she went down to South Texas and trained in the Jet Transition Training Unit in VT-21 down in Kingsville, Texas. Uh, her husband had gone through the jet pipeline, line, so he was at Oceana. Uh, she would gotten married to uh, actually a guy from Tennessee, uh, just like I was, lived up in Fentress County, and uh, Doug Knatzer, was an A6 pilot, uh, and while she was in flight training, he was beginning to get ready to go on his first deployment, and he wanted Rosemary to come home as soon as uh, uh, she could, and so uh, she wasn't going to get to do carrier qualifications again, but she would have gotten to fly in uh, the weapons program and the air combat maneuvering program, which was the last portion of the training. Uh, if she had stayed, but instead she uh, listened to her husband, uh, and she regretted that. Uh, but she came home early, and then uh, went and visited him while the, the squadron was on cruise. And uh, eventually she got to go back uh, at the end of that cruise, or at that tour at VC-2. Uh, she got orders to go to fly a new type of jet, an A-7, uh, which I was already uh, flying. and. Uh, she got an, an opportunity to go through and do some more weapons training and a little bit of air combat maneuver. Uh, but Rosemary, I recognized that she set a bad precedent when she left training early and didn't get every bit of training she could have. And that haunted women for about the next uh, five or six years. And she regretted that, wrote a nice paper, I've got that. Uh, in my book, uh, I write about these things. <laughs> Uh, but I also, in the last half of my book, uh, I uh, include uh, Rosemary's writings because she did write extensively about this stuff. And one of the first things she wrote about was uh, a uh, request that the Navy change its uh, 
training program for women aviators and not train women in the propeller prop line, but train them directly into the jets, like the men were being, uh, who were flying jets. Uh, because it, it sets up bad habits. It sets up habits of being conservative and uh, not flying the airplane to the edge of the envelope, which you're trained to do as a, as a jet pilot. You're also given out of control training, which is something that the propeller guys just don't do. They don't try that in, in a, uh, a two engine uh, airplane, and uh, that's basically designed to carry people and, and cargo uh, around in, in the Navy. So it's a different type of training, and Rosemary, one of the first things that she wrote about uh, was how the Navy needed to change that training. The Navy did change that training after she submitted that paper because they had an accident based on a young lady who uh, should have been able to recognize the out-of-control situation she was in but had not, not gone through the training. It basically uh, reflected what Rosemary had predicted might happen. Uh, also, one of the other women was getting uh, a syllabus and the Admiral, after they had that mishap, interviewed uh, Pat Dinkler and asked her about what training she was getting and he looked at it and he said, that's not, that's not adequate to be doing that. Somebody needs to review that. Let's change that. And so uh, Rosemary's uh, paper and uh, Pat Dinkler's uh, work with uh, Admiral McDonald uh, sort of changed the, the, the pipeline program and the women started being trained after after about four years. A few women got uh, to get trained directly into the uh, jet pipeline, which was a, a good uh, for the future of, of women flying jets. Um, Rosemary's uh, uh, A7 career, she had a very abbreviated schedule to, to get her through training because the Navy was beginning to take notice of the fact that the women were flying airplanes and they were wanting to fly airplanes that might end up in combat. Mm -hmm. And that was against the law, uh, part of the United States uh, Code uh, 10, uh, uh, Title 10, uh, 6015, uh, basically restricted women in uh, what they could do both on ships and uh, in the air. And so uh, Rosemary recognized that that needed to be changed, and she worked at that for uh, the rest of her career. But uh, to enforce that, uh, her detailer, uh, a guy named Chuck McGrail, who was a commander at the time, eventually made admiral, uh, and uh, he was in charge of implementing the uh, junior officer uh, orders and writing orders for people in various places. And so he was implementing basically Admiral Elmo Zumwalt who opened up naval aviation to women. Uh, his policies to let people do as much as they could do. And uh, so Admiral Zumwalt changed the Navy in a lot of ways. He was a very young uh, chief of naval operations and he had opened the program for the women. And so uh, later on in, in her career, Rosemary got a chance to talk to Admiral Sewall, and uh, she had, he advised her that you're going to have to change the law. I've done as much as we can do, and the uh, Navy's going to resist all the rest of the changes that you want to do. Uh, uh, and the only way to change that is to change the law. So um, Rosemary went through her A7 training, and uh, Commander McGrail said, "Get out of." Uh, Jacksonville where you're training as quick as you can and get to your next set of orders because once you're in the job it's harder to move you but they if they stop you right now on the way uh, you'll never get a chance to fly those things. So she ended up going to the Naval Weapons Center in China Lake which is where I met Rosemary. Uh, she got there at the start of 1977 and uh, had, had done her A7 training in December of 76, back when they didn't have any two-seaters, so it was a single-seat airplane. Uh, she had a guy chasing her on the wing, uh, but she had to uh, fly the airplane all by herself uh, right off the bat, just like all of us did at the time. And uh, so at China Lake, the, the weapons system was the focus of everything that you did, uh, from the uh, armament, uh, carriage equipment, 
to the uh, weapons themselves, to the electronics, to the control stuff, to the computers that uh, do the, uh, uh, sets up the sights in your heads up display. Uh, the A7 was a, one of the first airplanes to have lots of computers in it, not big computers. Uh, we had uh, 32 uh, kilobytes of memory. And uh, everything was written in uh, uh, machine language. And so, uh, but all of the ballistics tables, all the navigation stuff, controlling the projected map display, the con controlling the uh, digital display in the HUD, all of that done was done through one little 32K computer. Uh, much less than you've got to operate the, the dial on your watch. Uh, so, uh, Rosemary did not have much experience in the A7, so it took her a time to get into the projects for A7. But uh, she had uh, single seat jet time, and so the Naval Weapons Center had a targets department, which was uh, taking F-86s and converting them uh, into airplanes that could be flown remotely from the ground. <clears throat> so Rosemary uh, got involved with the target department. So her first jet flying at uh, China Lake was flying F-86s. And they're really good people. They really liked Rosemary. Uh, old uh, crusty fighter pilot named Harlan Reap was uh, uh, kind of her mentor there. Uh, me and Harlan eventually gave her a call sign of Sabre. Plane captains generally called her uh, Rosebud or uh, Rosie um, when, she, when uh, I first met her. And uh, so she flew F-86s, but she also met two people, uh, Nan and Gary Bailey, uh, who were sort of in charge of logistics at China Lake, and they ran a whole bunch of cats and dogs airplanes, uh, uh, twin-engine airplanes uh, largely that were cargo and uh, went and got uh, parts from all over the place. Because China Lake didn't, was pretty remote out in the desert north of, of Edwards Air Force Base uh, over the Sierra Nevada uh, mountains from where I was stationed in Lamore, California. And uh, uh, just across one set of ranges from uh, Death Valley. And so a lot of desert, uh, a, lot of, a lot of mountains. And uh, the airspace was wide open, really good weather. So uh, they would fly the targets uh, and uh, let people set up weapons uh, targeting for, on those individual targets. And then eventually, uh, as the weapon system developed, uh, they might shoot a missile at those targets. And Rosemary would go out, check the airplane out, make sure all the automatic flight controls were working. She'd take her hands off the controls and let Harlan fly the airplane from the ground make sure it, it properly recovered from various attitudes that he would put it in. Had a number of automatic uh, recovery procedures. And then uh, after the airplane had flown through its procedures, she would land the airplane. Uh, on a live presentation, she would engage the uh, parking brake and then turn on the automatic control system and then get out of the airplane. And then Harwood would take the airplane off, go out and present it as a target. Uh, people shoot at it. Uh, airplanes most of the time came home because we usually in our testing don't use live warheads. Uh, so sometimes a, a missile would clip a wing and the airplane would be lost. But large, many of these uh, airplanes would fly as many as uh, 100 presentations. Uh, but a lot of those were to uh, inert uh, warheads that came flying close, close by which is the way most of the, the weapons, uh, the sidewinders and sparrows are designed to get close to the airplane and then detonate. So a cloud of either continuously expanding rods or uh, shrapnel uh, is dispersed in a little cloud. So Rosemary flew it at uh, China Lake uh, in the Targets Department and also doing A7 projects. Uh, she also flew the A4, flew uh, uh, U-9s for logistics uh, flew the uh, variety of 
airplanes, a T-39, a T-38 a little bit. And uh, then she went over to the other squadron there, uh, weapons testing squadron, VX-5. At the time, now it's uh, VX-9. And uh, there's a lot of resistance there. Uh, their CO legitimately uh, said this is a special squadron. Nobody's here without fleet experience. And you don't have any fleet experience. You don't have any carrier landings. Uh, he rated her as the bottom pilot, uh, the bottom lieutenant, uh, 11 of 11. And uh, in one of my smarter moments, I suggested, Rosemary, you just write a letter, tell the Bureau that you're not being allowed to compete with these other people and that you're prejudged. And so she did. That letter eventually stayed in her record. When she went uh, before the command screen board, uh, she screened for command on her first look, uh, partially because she had written a, a no-nonsense uh, letter that basically said, uh, the CO won't allow me to compete with these people. They put me on the bottom of the stack. I understand, but I disagree with his, uh, his call on this. Uh, my value to the Navy is uh, not just in what I'm doing, and I'm doing a good job as a safety officer, uh, which is what her job was in the squadron. So two and a half years in VX-5 flying with very good people uh, in a, a difficult environment, being told no. She re uh, requested carrier qualification. Uh, her CO uh, was supportive of that, but the people who control the ships would not let her do that. Uh, she even flew the A-4 a little bit, which was a Marine Corps airplane that was at, at uh, VX-5. And the uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps ordered him not to let her fly in the Marine airplanes. And uh, the CO of the squadron said, well, I, actually, you're not my boss. So uh, it's the Navy airplane. And Navy squadron, and so Rosemary flew the, the A-4 Mike uh, when it was very politically uh, uh, incorrect for her to be flying that airplane. But she spent a lot of time at China Lake uh, and at VX-5 flying around the, across particularly California and the West Coast uh, to air shows and stuff. The airplanes that they flew at China Lake are very interesting. Uh, and. Uh, so if we could get funding for a flight, uh, she would take an airplane. Uh, we both took an airplane, got to fly together a few times. Uh, went out to Albuquerque uh, and various uh, uh, bases. Uh, my squadron at the time was at uh, Naval Air Station Lamore across the hill. And we got uh, assigned a project to do low altitude strike tactics against heavily defended targets. And Rosemary was our point of contact because uh, she's a good rider. She was working in the in Code 12 at China Lake, which was the technical riding group. And uh, they were, they did all sorts of projects for Third Fleet. And uh, one of the projects was this. I was on a team of, of guys who were doing, uh, had just gotten back from cruise. And so we were experienced and we did low altitude tactics. China Lake has a lot of threat simulators and live threats uh, that are uh, uh, anti or radiation uh, radars that uh, uh, both are on ships and land based that protect targets. Principally, at that time, were built by the by the Soviet Union. Uh, some French systems and even our some of our own systems that could be in the hands of somebody else. Uh, so we flew our uh, tactics to try to sneak in, uh, and mostly there were low altitude tactics that we were using because in Vietnam people mostly flew high altitude tactics because there's a lot of guys on the gun, on, on the ground with guns, and guns can shoot you down just about as well as a missile can if it hits you. And so flying down low you're in a lot higher threat environment. So that pushed all the airplanes up high. But we were seeing that the radars were getting better and there were becoming more of them, so we were trying to sneak in below the thing. Rosemary was our point of contact and she was helping us write the tactical memorandum. They had a form that they wanted the things to fit in. Rosemary fit our, our words in it. So we got, uh, uh, I was the junior officer on the group, so I did a lot of the writing and then I would deliver the, the drafts over to Rosemary. And uh, eventually we started dating and uh, and got married in China Lake after I got orders to the Naval Weapons Center. 
And so while she was at VX5, I was at uh, the Naval Weapons Center. We got a few chances to fly together there. Uh, at the end of that tour, she decided she wanted to go uh, to uh, the USS Lexington, which was opening up to women. It was the one ship that uh, was available for women. Had, a, had about uh, 100 women initially that were on the ship. They had not had a, a female aviator before. She was one of very few at the time. Only about uh, 50 women were flying at the time. So uh, I encouraged Rosemary. I said, you really need to if you're going to stay in the Navy. And she was thinking about astronaut training. She was thinking about uh, going to work for the airlines, which she would have been very employable by by that time. Uh, but uh, she decided to stay in and, uh, and then take the orders, which would not have been particularly good orders for a person with her talents. Uh, some, but somebody's got to go to the ships. And uh, uh, so uh, Rosemary went to the, the Lexington. And as the training officer, she got a very good training track. They trained her just like she was going to a fleet uh, ship. She was also in charge of the Combat Information Center, which on the Lexington is only a couple of radars that control airplanes coming in. To, uh, the Lexington's mission was to train pilots uh, on how to land on the ship. And uh, so Rosemary took over the training department and the Combat Information Center, got good training in route, and then uh, drove the ship for the next uh, two years. Uh, she also, well, unusual on, uh, amongst pilots, she got her surface warfare qualifications. and. Stood the watches down in the uh, the uh, engine room, fired off boilers, even going over and with the old Master Chief uh, to USS Alabama and picking up parts for the boiler because the Alabama had the same Babson and Wilcox uh, boilers that the Lexington had, uh, and it was on display over in in Mobile, and so they went over and got parts for the. Lexington from the USS Alabama, the battleship. So a lot of experiences there, had a real good CO, and so near the end of her tour, he gave her the opportunity to carry her qualified, and she carried her qualified in the uh, C-1, uh, which is an onboard carrier delivery of mail airplane, also delivered people, delivered me a couple of times to the ship. One time coming back from cruise, I spent the night putting away all of our you know, working with enlisted folks and getting their safes all full in our building. And then I flew back with uh, Rod Davis, uh, who came over and made a parts run with the Rocket Off Parts and to be reworked in uh, Mayport, which is where I was based at the time, on the carrier group staff. I jumped on the airplane with him that morning and dawn launched back to Pensacola, flew aboard the carrier uh, the morning I got back from being on a carrier uh, on a six-month cruise. And uh, uh, saw Rosemary uh, briefly on the bridge, had breakfast with her, went to sleep, got up, and pushed it, pulled back in, and we pulled back in the, in the port. Uh, so some interesting uh, times like that were kind of unique. Rosemary had actually got the opportunity to come out early to the ship on, on board the C-1. And uh, as we were coming back on the forest all, Admiral Chatham let her uh, come and join the ship and see the ship's operation because she was the combat information center officer on the Lexington even though they didn't have a very big combat information center. And we got to come into port together one time from cruise and see that experience. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of real unique experiences for the two of us. After that she went to the training command as an instructor and I went as an instructor. Uh, came out of the training command, went to the she went to the training uh, squadron uh, VA-122, which trained new A-7 pilots. She got to go back to the A-7. And then shortly after checking in to, to VA-122, uh, she uh, screened for command, which was uh, surprising because she screened on her first look. Uh, normally women would, for a support squadron, would only screen, uh, the, the men usually screen on their third look. Uh, first two looks are for a, an operational squadron, and then the third look for a training squadron or a support squadron. The Rosemary screened right off the bat, so suddenly she was a screen, uh, and she also uh, got promoted to commander on, the, on her first look. 
So she was suddenly a non-threatening person in the squadron who was a, was very much the confidant of her CO and uh, particularly George Cram when he took over the squadron. And Rosemary got a lot of opportunities to train with people, met uh, uh, the A7 community, flew with people, and, and spread the word about how well, what women could do. And uh, uh, so then went to her command tour down at uh, uh, VAQ-34 in uh, Point Magoo. I went down as a uh, department head uh, in one of the uh, branches there, uh, the Weapons Support Directorate. And then there was a storm happened. We ended up, she ended up taking her squadron around and their mission was to train the fleet. So she was training all the, the ships and the fleet as they went out over to Desert Storm. And I was in parallel providing weapons to those guys, filling up the magazines of, of eight carriers. And we had never filled out that many carrier magazines at one time. So we were very busy as was she with her squadron. Uh, after that, uh, uh, when the women came home from Desert Storm, the opportunity seemed to present itself to change what women could do because 35,000 women had served, about 41,000 had been in theater uh, in various jobs, and the country had seen women. Women had died in, at the edge of combat. Uh, they weren't in combat jobs, but uh, they still got killed by s scuds that came down on top of them behind the front lines. People got k killed in helicopters and uh, rescue missions and stuff. So. Uh, Rosemary joined with a number of other women in the Women Military Aviators Association and with the women that she had mentored with to push Congress to change the law. Uh, she had met with uh, uh, Admiral uh, Zumwalt and he was helping in the background uh, other admirals and, and uh, particularly uh, uh, Admiral Bill Lawrence whose daughter was in training to be an astronaut had gone through the uh, Naval Academy, one of the first classes. Rosemary had helped both the Navy and the Air Force uh, in their initial integration of women into the Corps of Cadets. Uh, she had helped out with, uh, had been an advisor to them, had been involved in a lot of things uh, that well above her pay grade, but because she was one of the few women uh, flying and had that much experience, she got a chance to do things like that. Had been served on boards, test pilot boards, command screen boards as one of the female representatives in the aviation area. So uh, she had a lot of contacts, knew a lot of people, and got the help of Senator uh, Bill Roth from uh, Delaware, Republican senator, who was aware of what women had done and was a supporter, a supporter of women at the time. And uh, he also got Ted Kennedy to co-sponsor legislation. The repeal of the combat exclusion laws went very easily in the House. Rosemary's uh, representative was at the time uh, a woman uh, from down Chattanooga, and because uh, Rosemary was a Tennessee resident, and uh, like I was, a uh, native Tennessee. And uh, so Rosemary uh, had, had a lot of support. Uh, Pat Schroeder was so, sort of the person that was the lightning rod for the for the women's issues. A lot of people were very critical of her, but uh, went through the House very easily. But there was problem uh, in the Senate. Sam Nunn was opposed to it. A uh, senator from, who was in charge of the Armed Services Committee uh, from down in Georgia, a powerful senator. And eventually, uh, Rosemary's former CO in uh, VA-174, where she transitioned to A-7s, uh, John McCain was also opposed. So uh, that was an issue. So Rosemary and uh, a number of other people, Carolyn B. Craft, Heather Wilson, who eventually became Secretary of the Air Force, uh, and a number of women military aviators. Rosemary was the president of women military aviators at the time, along with an Air Force colonel named Kelly Hamilton. They were, they called women from the Army, Navy, Air Force, and uh, to come to Capitol Hill. And their mission was to educate uh, the senators as to what women had been doing for the last 19 years. Uh, this was in uh, uh, 91, and uh, 
for 18 years the women had been flying, the women had been doing other stuff in the military, and they started educating it, and, but they went around in uniform, which was a dangerous thing to do from a career standpoint because uh, you're not supposed to go in uniform if you're uh, not representing the Navy in its policies, and they were very, again, very much against Navy policy. But they went in, in their uh, Liberty uniforms. Uh, the women went in whites, uh, and it was a summertime, so they were in their uh, service whites. And uh, very striking for these women to be walking down the halls with wings on their chest and their medals and their ribbons. Uh, and uh, as officers and, and talking to the various congressional people and uh, particularly the senators. And eventually, uh, on the Senate floor, the, the uh, bill passed with the provisions that uh, Senator Roth had managed to get in there to repeal the combat exclusion laws of, uh, that were both holding up the Navy and the Air Force. The Army did not have a law that was stopping it. It was stopping it by policy. So that passed. Uh, was signed in by the president in December uh, of 91, but there was going to be a commission to look at how we're going to integrate women. And Rosemary was very much opposed to that because they already knew how to integrate women. And uh, so she spent the next year mobilizing women. Every time that commission would show up at various bases, Rosemary made sure the Army or the Navy or the uh, Air Force had people there at the meeting with that commission that were in favor of women and had been doing stuff instead of just talking to the people. Because there was a large group of people on that commission uh, that were against uh, women uh, integrating at all. They wanted to push the clock back. So uh, that commission eventually sent out a report by one vote uh, recommended that women not be in in aviation, where they had been for the last 18, at that time, 19 years. Uh, but an interesting political event happened. Uh, Bill Clinton beat George Bush uh, in the election, and uh, the Clinton administration wasn't interested in the commission recommendations. He appointed a guy named Les Aspen, uh, and Les Aspen was interested in letting the women do as much as they could. The other thing that happened was the tailhook convention embarrassed the Navy, uh, and uh, so the admirals who wanted to hold things back, they didn't have much of a uh, platform which to speak from because it was clear that women were being institutionally discriminated against, and therefore people thought they could discriminate against women and, and abuse them individually. So that combined together to put the dynamic in place such that uh, uh, when Aspen opened up uh, aviation to women, combat aviation to women in uh, 93, in April of 93, it opened up all the services except the Marine Corps, which said all of our airplanes are combat airplanes, we can't let the women be doing this. And so they didn't open up until 93. And so the women started flying then. And, uh, after Aspen opened up stuff. Uh, Rosemary was at the, at the time was at the Pentagon uh, uh, when everything's changed. Then she went over to the National War College and taught after she, she had been in the class before she went to the Joint Staff and got her master's. And uh, then she went over and taught for uh, two and a half years as the chairman's chair for Joint Studies on, uh, at the National War College. Uh, after she retired in 97, she came back here. Uh, I was teaching high school by, the, by 2001 uh, at Anderson County High School, uh, teaching ROTC. And Rosemary wanted to get involved with uh, perhaps teaching, but at least with the young people here. She started working with the Center for the Study of War and Society, as it was named at the time. And then she started in uh, 2002 uh, teaching in the history department, uh, a military history class that was was uh, very popular and uh, taught until she uh, uh, came down with uh, ovarian cancer in the 2000, late 2014. Taught for 
year or so uh, off and on as she could. And uh, But she really enjoyed her time here. She, uh, once again, she enjoyed mentoring the folks, uh, uh, young students that were going through. She felt that it kept her young, uh, being in, in the classroom. Uh, she spent a lot more time getting prepared for each individual class than I did with my, my classes. Uh, Amazing, and she she really never taught the same class twice. She kind of reinvented it each each time she went through and brought in more and more stuff. Uh, and on the side, she uh, advised uh, NPR and uh, ABC on women integration issues. So uh, various combat evolutions started. Rosemary would get called in and go off and spend some time talking with them. She was a resource person for a number of people. Enjoyed her time uh, uh, immensely here. It uh, got involved with a little bit with the, the parades that they were doing and the veterans uh, celebrations that Sevier County has. Uh, I don't know if they still have that or not, if they've picked that back up or not. There's also the lecture series here at the, that uh, she enjoyed uh, working with and helping set those things up. And uh, so uh, she spent a good bit of her time working here at the University of Tennessee. Well, thank you. That was a, an amazing story of an amazing life and very well told. I think we'll take a short break here and, and see where we're at. If you want to